Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. This is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. And this week, uh, at this colloquium ends up promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. And every week, we will have an opener talking about, about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by the headliner giving us a keynote presentation. Our first speaker today is a graduate student from the Un University of California, San Diego. Specifically, they work for the center, they work with the Center for Visual Computing. Before that, though, they were a little bit closer. They went to the University of Waterloo for their bachelor's degree, where they honed their skills in numerical modeling and simulation and all that fun stuff. Uh, they also have a lot of work experience work, working with companies from all across the visual computing industry, such as uh, Activision Blizzard and side effects. Um, and I first met them in Montreal a few years ago when they were attending a conference there. And uh, it's become clear that this person isn't only kind, but very passionate about what they do. Also, they recently wrote a beautiful paper published at SIGGRAPH earlier this year. Please welcome, please welcome Sina Nabizade. Hello, everyone. Okay, I'll start sharing. All right. Um, okay, hopefully everything's fine. Um, so I'll start. Hello everyone, this is Mohamed Sinan Nabizada, second year PhD student at UC San Diego. We're going to take a quick look at our paper, Kelvin Transformations for Simulations on Infinite Domains. This is a working collaboration with professors Ravi Ramurthy and Albert Chern from UC San Diego. First, let's talk about partial differential equations or PDEs. These equations establish a relation between multivariable functions and their partial derivatives. In computer graphics, we might come across various forms of these equations, such as Poisson equation, which is used in applications such as doing Hodge decomposition or surface reconstruction, or Helmholtz equations, which is used mainly in physics-based sound simulations. Being able to effectively solve these equations is an integral part of many physical simulations and geometry processing algorithms. Further, solving these PDEs in an infinite domain is a common challenge. For example, in simulating open domains such as fluids or sound propagation, one often considers limiting the domain of the problem to reduce computational cost. In churn 2019 work, for instance, Absorbing boundary conditions are used to correctly handle infinite domains. Elsewhere in geometry processing, one might be interested in vector field design, where so far it's been mainly limited in bounded domains. One common way of solving for PDEs involves discretizing the domain. Here, for example, we're looking for the magnetic field around the sun. One approach to reduce the computational cost associated with infinite domains is simply truncating the domain. As visible here though, this leads to artifacts in the solution and limits the solution over space. Even though truncation is considered an effective method in scientific computing, for computer graphics applications, the requirements are more challenging. For example, the artist might require the simulation to correctly extend to the horizon. Another way of solving for PDEs is to use grid-free methods, such as the work by Sahani and Crane, Monte Carlo Geometry Processing. Using this method, the solution for the PDE at any point in the domain is given by the expected value of many random blocks starting from some point inside the domain and ending on the surface. Given an infinite domain, however, these random blocks seldom terminate on the surfaces. To ensure the blocks are finite, the Russian roulette method, which aims to randomly terminate blocks, is used. Compared to bounded domain results, this means the results will have higher variance, increased computational cost, and slower convergence. Yet another approach to solving PDEs in the infinite domain is to use coordinate mapping. In fact, today's talk is going to be quite relevant to this scheme. Say we're interested in solving for the infinite domain around this bunny. To do this, we first start by inverting the bunny. And next, we can discretize the inverted domain and finally invert back. This method results in an adaptive curvilinear coordinate covering our domain. Using this method, we're effectively squeezing the infinite domain to a finite domain, which would introduce non-smoothness in our functions. 
As a result, most PDEs are unsolvable due to bad conditioning or singularities. Using our method referred to as Kelvin transformation, many of the challenges previously mentioned are alleviated. For example, while we see the results around these objects correctly extend to the horizon, the PDEs that we solve for were done in entirely bounded domains. So let's see how we achieve our results. Our work has been motivated by the introduction of the classical Kelvin transformation by Lord Kelvin in 1845. To understand our method, consider solving for PDEs in the, in the infinite domain, say around our bunny here. To do this, we first invert our domain. Since we're effectively squeezing the entire infinite domain to a bounded region, we're going to introduce singularities in the solution. To get rid of these singularities, we decompose our function post-inversion to two parts, one analytical, which captures the singularities, and one smooth function, which we're going to solve for. Now we can solve for our PD in a truly compact domain using our favorite solvers. We finally put our singularity capturing function and our PDE solution back together using simple multiplication and an invert back. Indeed, as long as an inversion scheme and a singularity capturing function can be established, we can transform the infinite PDE problem to a bounded PDE problem. We call this method Kelvin transform, which generalizes to PDEs beyond Laplace problem, which Lord Kelvin mainly explored. In fact, Later, we'll see a much more challenging example of Helmholtz equation. For now though, let's consider Poisson PDEs, which span many applications in computer graphics. Here we can see an algorithm for solving Poisson equations in the infinite domain. Note that besides the PDE solve, which indeed happens in a bounded domain, the rest of the operations are simple arithmetic. With that, let's look at some results. A popular discretization scheme is the finite element method. Using this method and our Kelvin transformation, we can solve and extend the potentials defined on the surface of this armadillo to the space around it. So let's see this in action. First, we invert the armadillo, so the infinite domain is now captured in a finite space. Next, we'll tetrahedralize the space and clip the space to see what's happening inside. Knowing the nature of the PDE, we can analytically capture the asymptotic behavior function g and solve for the remaining part function v. Next, we'll multiply them back together and finally invert to get back to the original domain. Notice now that we have effectively solved the PDE for the entire infinite domain without having to pay an infinite computational cost. With Monte Carlo based method, Using an all Kelvin transform, we no longer need to use Russian roulette for solving infinite domain problems. Notice how 100% of the paths reach the bunny surface with our method, as opposed to only 8% using Russian roulette. For another example, consider this protein molecule made out of various atoms. First, we can construct an electrostatic potential map around the molecules and ask to extend the potential to the space surrounding the molecule. For visualization purposes, will constrain ourselves to a plane intersecting the molecule. Solving the potential values on this plane with Russian roulette, we see significant noise everywhere in the solution. Using our method, however, the noise is substantially reduced. Actually, to see this better, notice the difference in the insets between Russian roulette and Kelvin transfer. As the plot suggests, this is an order of magnitude improvement in error so with that, let's look at some practical applications with Kelvin transform. In geometry processing, people are interested in vector field design, which has been mainly limited to the bounded domain. However, using Kelvin transform, we are no longer limited and we are able to solve for the entire infinite domain. We can also use our method to solve the pressure projection step of fluid simulators in the infinite domain. With Kelvin transform, we can actually solve the pressure projection in the bounded inverted domain and invert back to get our results for the infinite domain. We can actually see the results on the right of this whole operation. Another place in solar astrophysics, given the magnetic flux on the surface of the sun, one might be interested in extending the harmonic magnetic field 
to the infinite space surrounding it. So far, the go-to approach to solving this problem is domain truncation, which leads to artifacts in the solution and limits the solution in space. However, using our method, the Kelvin transformation, we are able to truly solve and extend the magnetic field lines without any artifacts for the entire space. Finally, we can use Kelvin transform to solve the Helmholtz PDE in the infinite domain. In this example, we can see the acoustic wave generated by a vibrating bunny in the infinite 3D domain, which we have visualized as a 2D height field. Notice how even in the horizon, the waves are oscillating. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first time that an infinite domain Helmholtz equation is computed on a grid without the need for artificial absorbing boundary conditions. We approach this with the same mindset as our other selves. After an inversion and factorization, which is captured in function G, we discretize the inverted domain and solve for function V. Finally, we multiply the two functions and invert back to get our solution in the infinite domain. Notice that despite the grid resolution coarsening, accurate frequencies are still captured. This is due to the function G analytically capturing the oscillating behavior extending all the way to infinity. So today we introduce Kelvin transformation to solve infinite domain problems. Its two core components are a simple inversion and a factorization. For Poisson problems, this meant a wrapper around our solvers. And for Helmholtz equation, to the best of our knowledge, we introduced the first infinite domain computation of this equation without the need of absorbing artificial boundary conditions. The natural next question for future work is what other PDEs can benefit from Kelvin transform? With that, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that lovely talk, uh, Sina. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing more results in the upcoming years. Um, we're going to have a joint Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions, please hold on to them, post them on the YouTube, post them in uh, on the Discord, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to as many as we can. Otherwise, uh, Sina and our upcoming headline speaker can get back to you on the Discord server once, uh, once the talk is over. OK. So thank you, Sina. Our headline speaker today is zooming in all the way from the University of Washington, where they are an assistant professor in the Department of Bioengineering. And, they lead, and there they lead the Stevens Lab, where they are indeed the titular Stevens. They did their postdoc at MIT and a PhD at the University of Washington. And the research offers a very unique perspective on some of the problems we like to deal with in geometry processing. Uh, specifically, it focuses on different aspects of regenerative medicine. And to be honest, reading into it, it does seem like something that would come straight out of a science fiction movie. Um, to be specific, let's put it this way, if there's going to be a group that first successfully 3D prints a working functional human organ, their lab would be a strong candidate. It's an honor to meet them. Please welcome Professor Kelly Stevens. Hi everyone, thanks for the opportunity. This is a um, really neat group and um, I'm honored to be here. So thanks to y'all for the invite. Where our work is a little bit outside of your uh, typical, I, I, I fear I'm not gonna be able to give very much geometry today, um, but I think that our, our uh, ideas could be very synergistic as you'll see. And in fact, I actually just threw a couple of really last minute slides in to see um, to, to get to that. Um, so my lab is, um, is in, at the University of Washington and our whole goal is to try and build human tissue. So how, how can you build a human organ um, from scratch? Okay, think like Harry Potter type thing. To do that, we realize that what we're also gonna need to know is what human organs look like. What are they composed of? What are the cells, how are they organized? Um, what are the molecules and the molecular structures? All of the gooey stuff, right? And so um, we're working to not just um, build human organs, for example, with 3D printing, but also trying to understand what they look like. It's kind of shocking actually how little we know in that space. And our ultimate idea is can we use these engineered human organs or tissues as a, a, to implant into a patient and as either a bridge or an alternative to organ transplant, again, so kind of science fiction-y. 
we, like many others um, in our community and world, have been really inspired by the 3D printing re revolution. The idea being that if we can 3D print musical instruments and clothing and spacecraft and prosthetic limbs and um, cars, why can't we ultimately someday 3D print a human organ, right? And one of the reasons that 3D printing really struck us is because the structures of organs are extremely complex, like I mentioned, okay? And so these are just some actually incredibly simplified um, views of what these organs look like or are thought to look like. Some of these are actual casts of the blood vessels that feed through your organs, and some of them are artistic, uh, artistic reconstructions, right? And so what you can see here is that many of our at least large human organs in the body, like your lungs, your heart, and your liver, um, are able to get as big as they are because they're filled with um, blood vessel networks that keep them perfused with blood and oxygen and other nutrients, right? And so it's basically the tubes that run through your organs to feed them. And, and as you can see here, they're super, uh, actually really beautifully geometrically complex too. It's actually, there's actually a lot of really interesting studies um, on vascular patterns like fractals and blah, 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 right? Um, and, and our favorite organ that we've been focusing on over the last few years in my lab has been the liver. If one was to take a cartoon of the liver, now you see the blood vessel networks here in blue and red. And what you can see is that these, each of these blood vessels are within literally one cell width. So here are the working cells of the liver called hepatocytes, okay? Those are the cells that do all of the functions of the liver. It's basically a chemical processing plant and, and production plant. And this is where all of that stuff happens. And these cells called hepatocytes in peach, okay? And so the blood keeps the hepatocytes alive, right? And then these hepatocytes are um, uh, stuck with the liver. Again, one of the neat things here is the really cool geometric organization um, of sort of patterns within patterns within patterns in the liver. And so we collaborated with Jordan Miller, whose lab is at Rice University. And we said, well, how do we 3D print this thing, right? Um, one of the challenges in the field has really been how do you 3D print something that's really big with a lot of fluidic complexity. Jordan's lab came up with a new biomaterial um, that basically allowed us to take um, a, a lot of the work that had been already being done in other 3D printing industries for hard plastics and now do it in a soft, mushy, jello material that was compatible with living human cells. Okay. And I won't go into the super details of the actual chemistries and stuff since it's geometry and instead just show you what we can do with it. So again, these are these gels that you see here are, um, it, it, it feels like a jello if you push on it. And what you can see is we can print quite complex uh, fluidic networks through here and they're entangled and they're um, uh, um, um, uh, Probably there's a, the channels are around 300 microns currently in, in um, resolution, which is still, we have a ways to go before we get down to the sort of the human blood vessel level, which the smallest vessels go down to around five microns, right? And so we have some ways to go, but still this is uh, really um, advancing the field in terms of how complex we can print. Um, you know, one of the things that of course, if you're going to be printing 3D uh, human organs, is one needs to also um, create these things with cells in them, right? And so these are again living human cells from um, either patients uh, in, or, or um, um, donors uh, in this case. Okay, and so here are the green cells we've um, colored them green um, are uh, hepatocytes. So again, those are liver cells. These red cells here are the ones uh, that are called endothelial cells that line your blood vessels. So we've been able to make 3D printed tissues that combine these two cell populations. We can implant them in mice. We've shown that the tissues have some metrics anyway of uh, liver function after they've been implanted. Now there's a lot of work to be done there still and um, that they live and they survive in the mouse. I won't go into those details. Um, this is an example of how many blood vessels, actually, this is pretty neat, actually. Nature also has a way of organizing these things on their own. Um, and so what we find after we implant these tissues, if we do it in the right materials and the right mixture of 3D printed stuff, what we find is that the cells within the tissues themselves will reach out and self-organize literally crawl around, make connections with each other and stuff um, within the um, mouse itself. 
and um, start to vascularize these networks. So here's again, um, sort of self-organized by the cells themselves, networks of blood vessels within these tissues. And there you can see how they're feeding these human hepatocytes or liver cells that we put in, okay? One of the things that's been really neat is to say, okay, well, you know, uh, one of the problems in the field has been, well, we have some ideas of what human blood vessel networks look like. None of the technologies uh, to date that have been used to image these networks actually have been able to acquire, for example, uh, blood vessel networks, what do they look like? Um, all the way from the very finest scale, which is like five microns, like I said, all the way up to uh, an organ level. Okay, so we don't have a whole organ blood vessel networks. In other words, we don't know what the blueprints are that we would need to 3D print if we actually wanted to make it like a human organ. And not only that, we know that these networks vary from person to person, okay? And so to get around that, we don't actually know what the blueprint is. Um, uh, Jordan's group in collaboration with um, Nervous System, a company out in uh, actually now in New York, um, has been developing these algorithms. The algorithms are really driven by nervous system. If y'all are interested in checking them out, they just do beautiful stuff. And to sort of make vascular inspired networks, okay, with branching um, algorithms. But, and I, I won't go through the details again, but it's basically by saying, um, having these uh, organically, biologically inspired um, things, uh, networks that literally grow um, based on hormonal location in the, um, in the um, computational network. So anyway, so we've been able to make these networks um, uh, computationally, right? And then um, have been able to show that we can 3D print these networks um, into tissues that are now up to a couple centimeters across, okay, which is actually really big for tissue engineering still, uh, this field of making new organs. And then we can fill those tissues up with these, uh, these liver cells again, okay? So here, these are hepatocytes, the liver cells, and we can fill them up all the way across. We're looking at a cross-section. So now you're looking at each, quote, blood vessel um, running through and cross-section, right? So when I just kind of alluded to the fact that we're sort of punting right now, right? So we're, we really don't actually know what we're supposed to be 3D printing from all the way up from cellular, all the way up to the organ scale. And my group started, it was kind of odd. We didn't really even start appreciating this in detail until just a year or three ago. It was really a sort of relatively recent thing that we started saying was, gosh, we really need to make better organ maps if we're really gonna do this, right? And so let me show you just a little bit of what we've done in that space. So for example, if you're to look up, what do livers look like? Um, Google hepatocyte anatomy or, or something, right? You're going to find stuff that looks like this, which is off, off, often out of a textbook, okay? So an artist's rendition of what they think it looks like. And that's often based on a lot of different sets of data, like one set of data might show like the super zoomed in version and one set of data might show a super zoomed out version, but there's nothing where you can like have a Google map, right? That goes back and forth and stuff. So that's what we've been working on most recently. These are the slides that I, this is actually the first time I'm presenting these slides, so bear with me. But I thought y'all might get kind of a kick out of some of this stuff. And then there's a lot of possible synergy here with your interests. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing is we take human livers and some of the human livers are normal. Some of the human livers are diseased. And then we cut a chunk out of the human liver. We are not going organ scale yet. And we cut it out and then we can slice it up into thick slices though, okay. Um, and then we can use these various chemical treatments um, that our lab has developed based on other labs and everything else that allow you to essentially make the tissue more transparent, which allows you to throw it on a microscope, take thick images across the tissue. And now you start to see all of these different um, structures within the tissue that I've been talking about. Okay, so for example, these are the tiniest blood vessels in the liver called sinusoids. You can see how they make these sort of like web light neck structures. This is the actual microscope image here. And then we do various um, image processing on these to, to get to quantify them and segment them and whatnot, right? Segment and then quantify and whatnot. Um, this is again, the raw uh, microscope structure. These are the bile ducts in the liver. So you have blood vessels that bring stuff in to the liver and then you have other um, uh, networks that bring stuff out, other tubes basically that bring stuff out of the liver, sort of like the waste 
hand wavy, that's a little bit over generalization, but think of it as sort of the stuff that goes out of the liver. And um, so the, another set of tubule networks here, you can see. And again, we do thresholding and segmentation and stuff on them to get out these uh, um, pictures. So this is the sort of stuff that now we're able to start to take a look at as we can get um, livers across, uh, pictures of whole livers across chunks. We can sort of zoom in to a given what's called a lobule, one of those little hexagonal things that you saw in the schematic before and start to get an appreciation for what do these things really look like when you zoom in. So again, here you see all the blood vessels um, in pink, the smallest blood vessels, and then you see the bile ducts, the out tubes um, in green, right? And, just, and then we zoom out a little bit more and you can see now these are the bile ducts, the tubes that bring stuff out and green and we've got big, huge blood vessels in purple and we've got other blood vessels in orange that wrap around here. So you can see how beautifully localized. We've got two different types of blood vessels here, one in purple and one in orange wrapping around each other. So it just gives you a really big appreciation for really how complex nature is, right? And if we're really gonna get this right, it's gonna take a lot of levels of iteration and detail. Um, I'm not going to actually go through the details of this other than to say we can do it. And that basically says once you start to get these um, computational pipelines in place, you can start to look at, for example, how different are the blood vessel networks between normal liver, which is here, versus diseased, highly diseased liver, which is down here. And what I hope you can just appreciate by looking at this is, wow, um, I hope uh, it starts to appreciate why folks with cirrhosis or chronic liver disease get so sick. Right, and we go through and quantify all of this, which I think is not is really beyond what we care about here. And same with this here, the bile ducts of the liver. Okay, and so now, um, before I was showing you the blood vessels, the tubes that bring stuff in, and now I'm showing you the bile ducts that bring stuff out. And what again, I hope you can appreciate here is how dramatically different they are between a normal liver here to a cirrhotic liver. This is one of the hexagons here. Okay, to just give you an appreciation of scale called the lobule. Um, and again, I'm not gonna go through the details of that, but suffice to say, we're trying to map these things both in um, uh, normal and disease so that we can actually know what to 3D print. The wild thing is though, it's not just where the different cells are at in an organ or where the different parts are at, but it's also what types of cells are there. and. Um, and what, what are those cells doing? How are they functioning? In other words, what molecules do they, a biologist would say, what do they express? Meaning what genes are turned on and off, what's active and not active, okay? So there's a lot of really cool technologies lately to start to say, well, what types of cells do we have and what kinds of genes are on and off those cells? But until recently, this is a, a, a field called transcriptomics, okay? We're looking at RNA, expression patterns um, within these cells, the single cell, um, at, at the resolution of a single cell, okay? And the problem has been that it's fine, we have a big, um, essentially encyclopedia of what different cell populations we have, but until recently, um, within the last year or two or so, um, people weren't able to say where the cells were coming from, okay? So we had the, the list of cells, but we didn't have their spatial location. I'm gonna just zip really fast through this because I think that the other stuff took me a little longer. But um, basically we've been able to use our 3D printing and biofabrication technologies to now allow us to essentially barcode where different cells are coming from um, when we pick up their signal. So here you've got, in this case, a mouse embryo. And what you can do is slice it up, um, um, post-mortem obviously, and, and, um, and, and then take a look at it. This is a very standard thing that biologists often do. Put it on a piece of glass and that's how you look at it, look at it under the microscope, right? What we're able to do is use our, um, our barcodes um, to essentially barcode where all of the different cells are at within that embryo, okay? And then we can use those barcodes to later pull out um, to tell us where the cells were coming from when we do our sequencing um, downstream. And so now we're able to get not just like the pictures of where the cells are at under the microscope, but we're also able to understand what those cells are, how they're functioning, what they're doing, what they're expressing. Okay. So what, again, genes are active, what's on and what's off in these different cells. And how is that correspond with where those things are located across the embryo? Um, okay, and so how does how does all of this come come into play in with recent, with um, uh, respect to building an organ, right? Okay, so 
one of the things that I often think about is, you know, it's not just a matter of where each hepatocyte is located within um, the liver. Okay, this is pretty wild, actually. The liver has so many functions, it's got over 500 functions, okay, chemical processing and production functions, like I mentioned, it produces all your protein, a lot of your proteins, for example. And if you have a drug, uh, if you have if some kind of a pharmaceutical, it will go and get processed by your liver um, often. Okay, and so one of the problems is there's each of these hepatocytes, these liver cells are supposed to do so many different functions. It's like mind boggling for them, right? And so if you had to do 500 functions, but you had a group of many of you um, sitting in a little space to do those functions, how, how might you handle that? You would divide and conquer, right? And so some members of your group would do some of the functions and some members of your group would do the other function. That's exactly what the liver does. And it's really neat how it, it does it. It's essentially spatially organized at the molecular level across these lobules, okay? And so some of the hepatocytes, like sort of in the inner region here, will do some of the functions. And then other hepatocytes in the outer regions will do a different set of functions, okay? And so this radial division of labor in the liver is called liver zonation. And there's actually at least 3,500 3, or so zonated genes in the liver and probably more than that. And so this is just like tons of different molecules are turning on and off in different low spatial locations across the liver. So when you're 3D printing these cells, you don't often think about like which hepatocyte is, what, what are the hepatocytes doing, right? It's more just like you throw down hepatocytes without thinking about this fine level of detail. And so we said, well, we'll go, what, we, what we ought to want to actually be able to do is not just place the hepatocytes in these tissues, but also to be able to control what the functions um, that they have that they're doing so we can get this zonated pattern of functionality, right? And so again, I'm going to skim through this kind of fast, um, but basically what we said is, <laughs> how can we essentially command cells um, from the outside to do stuff that we want them to do, right? This is really what it comes down. How do you say um, cell A, you do this and cell B, you do that, okay? And so we said, well, what if, and, and in a spatially orchestrated way, and so what we realized was if we could pattern some kind of physical stimuli like light or heat or some other thing, and then we could engineer the cells themselves so that they're sensitive to that stimulus. Okay. So it would be like making me, um, I, I, I go brush my teeth if you turn the light on, right. Or something like that. Um, here, the cell is told to um, metabolize blah, blah, blah. If you, um, in this case, turn on heat. Okay. And, and then what if we can spatially organize where um, the light or the heat is at, right, um, within those tissues? So we ended up using heat as a physical stimulus for this. The idea being, for various reasons, um, thermal gradients, forming gradients, which is great for biology. There's gradients all over your body of different things, from molecules, different proteins, gene expression, you name it. There's just tons of gradients everywhere. Um, heat travels through tissues really deep. Um, compared to some other um, methods. And, and actually there's a lot of genetic engineering out there that's starting to use heat switches within cells, okay? So what we said was, well, we know that for example, the pipes on our walls use, or in our cars use heat exchangers. So you pump hot fluid through some tubes, you pump cold fluid through other tubes and the, um, the, the fluidics within these networks are designed to essentially transfer heat um, from the hot tubes to the cold tubes, right? That might be to cool, cool uh, machines off or like whatever it might be. It's like your radiators, for example, um, the old school kind that makes noise um, are heat exchangers. And so we said, well, we actually have a way to make fluidic networks throughout tissues. We have these 3D printing systems. So actually all we have to do is pump some hot through it, fluid through those and um, pump some hot fluid through our tissues. If we engineer our cells to, um, uh, to respond to these, um, to brush their teeth, so to speak, in response to heat, then in theory, we should be able to spatially orchestrate what cells are turning what on in that 3D printed tissue, right? So we, again, we printed our fluidic networks and, um, and we then um, showed that we can heat up the networks. This is a, um, a thermal uh, camera to look at where heat is, how the thermal energy is distributed across the surface of those tissues. And basically it shows, yep, we can make gradients, temperature gradients across the tissues. And I won't go into the genetic engineering details, but basically we engineered human cells to be responsive to heat, okay? And we said, hey, when you turn heat on, 
we want you to activate this um, fire. Actually, in this case, it's pretty cool. It's a firefly gene, okay, that actually glows um, in response to heat. And so here we're looking at the glow of the gene. So these are 3D printed tissues, okay, and they're 3D printed with uh, fluidic patterns like this. And in this case, we take hot fluid and we pump it through these just uh, networks, just like this. When we look at the, the heat uh, across the uh, tissue, what we see is these nice gradient patterns and they change depending on what direction the fluid is pumped or if it's hot or cold, right? That kind of makes sense. What's pretty neat is when we put these human cells across the tissue, we just layer all the human cells all the way across the tissue, all uniform. But when it's, what's neat is that when we pump the fluid through, um, the, the, um, the firefly gene comes up when um, in sort of a similar pattern to where the heat has been, okay? So in other words, they're heat activated. You can spatially pattern in these different patterns just depending on how you pump the um, fluid through. So this is kind of heavy biology. So again, I'm not gonna go into it too much, but basically what we said was, okay, so now we have heat, we can tell cells what to do. So what we're gonna do is tell them to turn on specific liver, specific genes, okay? And so we did that and we can show that we take these genes that are known to be spatially um, zonated in the liver and we can turn them on in, in sort of these gradients, okay, using this um, method. So I've kind of taken you through how we're deconstructing and reconstructing tissues. And I said, we're making maps, we're um, um, 3D printing human tissues. And I've always had this patient over here on the right. Um, and I think that one of the things that has become increasingly, I'm gonna kind of whip through this last little bit here because I see that we're getting down. One, one of the things that has become increasingly um, uh, important to me is the realization that this human is actually not just one human, right? And I, as one of those cautions that I just wanna throw out to all of you that are listening today is when you're doing any kind of technology development or science or biomedicine or whatever it might be, Think about it, not for one person, but for all of us, right? And, and those, these groups are very diverse groups of individuals. And I really appreciate um, that um, y'all said today that this is partly looking to increase visibility and representation um, for geometry folks. Um, I, that's really awesome because I, I really think that this is really, really critical, right? So in my field, just one example, Black and brown individuals suffer from health disparities disproportionately. So did you know that um, African-Americans are more likely to die at early ages from all cases, okay? From all causes, okay? So here, what you can see is um, uh, how um, black individuals are dying in red um, disproportionately high across all age groups, right? Um, of the individuals, um, uh, Americans uh, um, from US in the 35 to 44 age group, my age, um, half who died were Hispanic and a quarter black, which is way higher than the population levels by about threefold, okay? Um, and one of the things I just wanna draw our attention to is that we all suffer because of heart uh, health disparities, right? We're all connected. We're only strong as our most marginalized link, right? So this is a map of Seattle where I live. And what I hope you can appreciate is that um, COVID-19 didn't just stick in one community, right? And so actually we have, um, Seattle is a very segregated community like many um, Amer uh, American cities. And um, so a lot of our racial and ethnic diversity is in the south of the city. And you can guess where based on this map, right? So there's disproportionate access um, to medical um, uh, technology and everything in the beginning of COVID, right? And, and so what you see here is that you have these hot spots and over the course of time, these they would diffuse out um, across the rest of the city, right? And so why do I bring this up? Um, first, do no harm. So our high science and engineering is one of the root causes for this problem. I just wanna highlight it and say, um, make sure that you're thinking about this, right? So for example, there's a pulse oximeter that folks have been using on their fingers to see how high their blood oxygen levels are. When they plummet, they go to the doctor, right? Or they go to the ER. The problem with is those things that don't work as well on black individuals, okay? Three times more likely to fail on a person with darker skin tone. Um, which seems uh, pretty unfortunate and racist, right? Um, it's very, very um, dangerous for those individuals. And it's not because, I, I don't think it's because um, those of us that have white skin are um, jerks or uh, intentionally trying to make devices that 
um, kill some individuals and not others, right? Um, but it's just that good people can have blind spots and each person draws on their own experiences. Science and engineering products aren't likely, aren't as likely to work for folks um, that aren't represented on their teams, right? And so I just wanna just give a really quick overview here. This is the US population anyway. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of these colors. I think you can sort of uh, get the picture. Um, but what I hope you can see is the differences in diversity here um, in the U.S. population compared to U.S. biomedical researchers. Okay, it's really quite stark difference. And um, there's a lot of um, talk about why this is. And so for those of you that are out there right now, I can say there's a lot of reading in science and work in this space and um, it's very established why this has happened. And so if you're sort of unconvinced or unclear about why, I would just throw out a um, favor to ask of you and read some of these books so that you educate yourself to make sure that when you're doing your technology development, you're really thoughtful about this thing, right? We don't wanna be causing harm um, to some individuals accidentally. Okay, I'm gonna skip this part. And basically just to say, um, if um, we were actually able to reach um, the demographics of diversity of whether in my case, it would be in the US um, or Canada or um, you know other countries or worldwide or whatever it might be, um, there's so much study out there that shows that we would have substantively more growth in our professions. We'd have more money, including science and jobs and innovations and more people treated. We'd be able to solve some of these. Maybe we could actually open our border um, for good so we could travel back and forth because we could get this pandemic under control because we'd have more bright minds working on these things, right? With more um, different viewpoints and how to solve them. I love this book that goes through this whole thought process that I just skimmed over a little bit to check it out. Um, how are we supporting the diverse individuals that we have in, um, in my field? Not great. Um, in fact, quite poorly. For example, um, the major funder for our type of research um, that I do is the National Institutes of Health and black individuals have uh, half as high of a funding rate as white individuals. That means they don't get as much money to do their research. So they just can't do as much, right? And then they have to spend more time writing grants. And it's a very vicious cycle that ends up mattering quite a lot for faculty. This is just one example. If you haven't checked out this paper, please consider doing so. It's called Fun Black Scientists. Um, so with that, I just want to leave you with this idea that um, diversity is innovation, diversity is power. I'm really happy to see what y'all are doing here and appreciative of it. These are some bile duct fireworks um, before I leave you. These are the authors that wrote the Fun Black Scientists um, paper. And I just want to draw attention to all of them and say that one of the things that I've realized in my career is how much more gratifying it is and how much more I learn when I get to work with a set of individuals that um, have uh, various lenses of diversity, right? And with that, I just wanna say thanks to my group. Thanks to y'all for the opportunity to talk. Thanks to our funding. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for that lovely and enlightening talk, Professor. Um, we're going to move on to the Q&A session now. So we've been fielding questions coming in from Discord, YouTube, uh, um, and uh, I guess if, if you emailed them in, then we'll also be looking at those. Um, so I guess our first question is for uh, Sinna. Um, sometimes boundary conditions at infinity are um, important. So if you wanted to impose let's say a specific boundary condition and could you, could your method be adapted for that? Does it support that very well? Uh, right, uh, so, sorry. If the, if the boundary condition is constant, we can just sort of like adjust for the constant, like subtract a constant from everything. And then we're, we're back to the sort of assumption that the, everything approaches zero at infinity. And if it's not, let's say like, if it's like a function, like an X or something, and it's approaching asymptotically to that, then it's all about like the asymptotic capturing function G. So the asymptotic capturing function G would start capturing that and we wouldn't basically have a problem. So as long as you can find this asymptotic capturing function G, we can support all sort of uh, different boundary conditions. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, this next question is for Professor Stevens. 
Um, you, you talked a little bit at the end about how um, there's a big problem and disparity in some of the medical um, uh, procedures that we develop for African-Americans or underrepresented groups versus white people. When you talk about um, uh, reconstructing these human organs or human tissue cells and evaluating a little slice of, um, a, of a liver at a time, how does that, how do you keep, how do you keep that into account? Uh, how do you take that into account to uh, maintain a, a good balance of diversity yeah. in your experiments? That's a great question. And this is exactly, I mean, so what I can tell you is really wild about this, right? It was what we first started doing was just collecting all of the tissues that we could get access to, which is not incredibly easy. And in, in Seattle, where I live, um, it's, a, it's a less diverse population than um, US wide, okay? So for example, um, for black individuals, we have, I think 13% um, in US, whereas for example, in Atlanta, it's more like 50%, okay? And so a really quite a different population slice. And so, one of the problems that we have is just having access to the samples, right? So um, actually all of the livers that we've scanned so far have been from white individuals. And now we've only done five, um, five disease livers, for example. It's not like it's a huge data set yet. That was, that's actually unpublished data. I should have said that is brand new, um, which is why I threw it in at the last second when I realized that would be a potential. We have a lot of need for machine learning interfaces and um, ways to analyze that data and stuff, right? Which is why I threw it in. But from the standpoint of representation, I think that this question is exactly what I'm hoping to stimulate y'all's thinking on, and I'm really appreciative of it. And before um, I, you know, when I say the before, I mean before the COVID nineteen area, maybe five years ago, even I don't know that I would have thought thought that question, right? And that's that's terrible, right? And so let's just all be really cognizant of it. And what I can say is, right now we're trying to get access to samples that would be um, representative, right? And then also when we're building our engineered tissues, we are, like I said, we use human cells in those tissues, right? So one of the things that we've been really cognizant of more recently is just saying, let's at least make sure that we get a good racial and ethnic um, and gender balance and everything else when we're looking at all of our different uh, populations, right? The type of studies that we do, it's a little bit difficult to uh, say, are there differences between these um, various populations without intentionally asking that because our sort of sample size is so low. Um, but there's certainly other scientists out there that are doing that type of work. And I think it's gonna be increasingly um, important for us to at least be aware. And then the way that I really think about it is the most important part from my standpoint is to make sure your team that's doing the work is diverse because I've already found, even as I've diversified my own team intentionally, just how much different um, ways of thinking about things have come into it, right? Like who is the population that you're engineering for? If you're um, engineering of therapy that they're not going to want to use, that's a problem, right? Or they don't trust, for example, um, or something like this, right? And so you just have to be really thoughtful of that stuff right from the onset. Yeah, definitely. This is also a, um, a question that we need to be uh, addressing all the time in computer graphics. I mean, you showed a yeah. You showed a graph of uh, a chart of the, you know, population differences in biomedical engineering for um, between underrepresented groups and white people, and I don't even, I don't even want to think about what it's like in uh, computer science. Um, yeah, and, and as you know, it's important, really important. There's a lot of like, for example, AI tools out there and stuff that have a lot of um, biases built into them, and that can be really. So actually, there's some. Um, examples in the biomedical space where AI has been used. And again, it's, it's sort of deadly for some groups because of the sort of racial and ethnic biases that are built, right? You know, it's AI is only good as the person that creates it in the beginning or the, or the data that it's trained on, right? And so all of these things we need to be really thinking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now we have a few questions for Sina as well. Um, so, when you invert your domain to solve your PDE in a finite space now, uh, what sort of topology change needs to happen? Do you need to have an adaptive mesh uh, once you've inverted it or do you, and do you need to keep sort of track of remeshing it as you're inverting it? So, so for example, for the armadillo example, 
we sort of inverted it and then we just like uniformly just tetrahedralized it. So, but then it so happens that when you invert it, if, if you like remember that figure or that video is that that uniform tetrahedralization becomes suddenly adapted. So, mm -hmm. but, but the reality is that when you're trying to solve for it and the solve is happening, it's all uniform and pretty simple. Or like if, you, if it's 2D or if it's a grid, it's all like uniform grids. Okay, and a follow, I guess not a follow up, but another question is that if you have multiple objects in your scene, can your method be accommodated for solving this PDE? in an infinite domain yeah. with more than one object, what does the center of the inversion become specifically? Right, so so like for example, for the Seagraph 2021 example, you I think we put the center in one of those letters. So the reason we put it in one of the letters is that sort of given that the boundary condition is actually defined on those letters, we want, the, we want it to be exploding so that it covers everywhere in, in our inverted domain because once once the center is surrounded by a like a bounded object or let's say one of those letters like a c graph i that suddenly surrounds everything in the inverted domain so it becomes a truly bounded domain in that way so that's for example one place we would place the center for those examples i see makes sense um now we have another question for professor stevens um are you reproduce the spatial heat gradients for these, I, I'm going to say wrong, the hepatocytic cells. Am I saying that right? Hepatocyte, uh, you're close. Is, uh, are these patterns in heat gradient, are they part, do you, are, is it known what underlying physical process causes them? And if so, is it, uh, can you take those patterns and apply them to another problem? Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, so that's a really interesting question and one that a lot of um, biologists wonder and engineers do all the time. And in fact, there's like two decades of work trying to figure out what is it that sort of commands um, how, all, so like I said, there's about, um, there's thousands of genes that change their um, expression. So how on or off they are based on in a spatially, uh, spatial way, right? And so the question is like, is there any sort of master signal, like whether it's physical or uh, like something mushy, right? Like a molecule or something um, to, to sort of say, I'm the boss and y'all have to march in line and get spatialized up, right? <laughs> and um, yeah, as the field is emerging, there is um, a couple of signals that uh, sort of drive it. One, um, there's one biology chemical signaling pathway um, in just the last couple of years that seems to be sort of a master orchestrator of that. It's called the WINT signaling pathway. So it's a biochemical cascade, right? And um, so that's actually what we used when we did that. And I didn't go into those details, but basically what we said was we're going to turn on this master regulator WINT cascade, the chemical, right? Uh, or the um, gene for that one. And then what we expect is that when we do that, that one will tell all of the other ones to spatially localize as well, right? Um, that was like our hypothesis. We didn't know that, we just guessed it, right? And but, but actually it ended up being true that if we were able to turn on this master regulator, then all of, or, or at least all of the ones that we checked, we checked about 10 uh, other genes, um, at least so far, sort of walked in line, right? So you turn this one on the way you want it, and then you expect that the other ones will follow, and they did in that particular case. And so it's a really complicated field, oxygen levels. So again, um, uh, where you're located with respect to your blood vessels matter, um, uh, the wind signaling pathway, so chemistries matter, and then it's just like this huge field looking at all kinds of different signals. Yeah, good question, it's cool. It's pretty neat. I mean, it's it just is really mind blowing how, complicated um, uh, uh, nature is, right? And I should say um, this biochemical, um, you said, can you apply that elsewhere? Absolutely, because for example, these biology signaling pathways, chemicals, um, the WINT pathway, for example, that's this master regulator, it master regulates all kinds of things in your body, okay? And so for example, it will say when you're, when you're first developing in mom's belly, it says what's gonna be the top and what's gonna be the bottom. Okay, before it, you turn into all of your heart and your liver and your lungs, just the simple like what's the top and what's the bottom, what's the back, what's the front, right? Um, and so these are all the same signals actually, it's just they're set up and combined differently. And so 
you could absolutely use this technology, for example, to, to tell an embryo what's the top and what's the bottom or something. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, and then this last question is for, I guess, a little bit of both of you. It's more to get a joint discussion going on. Um, so people in graphics or engineering like Sina or like us, uh, we like to sometimes uh, create accurate computer models and simulations um, to predict complex processes. But when you show us a picture, like a picture of all those tiny little cells of a millimeter of a, a liver, uh, it almost seems sort of hopeless uh, in terms of getting an accurate simulation out of here. Uh, so is there still a use for these types of hyper accurate computer simulations? Well, what balance should we try striking between accuracy and efficiency, both in biomedical applications uh, and going into computer graphics as well, I guess. Um, I don't know, maybe one of you guys can answer. If I you... guess I can start, Sina, and you, we, I'll, I'll go, go fast. We always wonder that. It's the same with 3D printing tissues, right? I mean, it's like, how good is good enough? Like what we're doing right now is so coarse in resolution compared to what a human, we just can't even, we're not even close, right? <laughs> Um, but yet, that said, these things, there's many functions that they can do. And in some cases, if you have a diseased organ, depending on what kind of disease it has, it might only be missing, for example, one gene, which means you can't produce one protein and your body only needs a tiny bit of that protein. And so it might be that you could um, have just a small little human organ that all it has to do is be able to print did, is to um, produce that protein and then you'll be fine, actually. And so I think it's really going to be what are you trying to do with it on the other side and is so setting your endpoint and your goal i guess i think is really important at least for my field from the perspective of 3d printing human organs and mapping and stuff what are you using it for and then just from the knowledge acquisition side um it, it is it is seemingly impossible right but gosh i cannot believe how much the 3d printing organs field has leapt forward in just like the last five years alone and so what I would just encourage you all to do is just keep taking the next step. And, um, and then also um, try and take the next leap if you can, right? But, but, in, but don't get too mind boggled by the fact that it's just the next step and then ideally the next, next leap because um, huge progress is being made, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's exactly right. Like sort of what, what, are, what are we exactly aiming to solve here? Like, it, it, for example, for computer graphics, a lot of time people think of like, I guess, I don't know, movies or entertainment. And for that purposes, you sort of just want to aim for the looks. You don't really maybe really want to aim for the accuracy of things. But but elsewhere, I guess in engineering, when you're doing like a fluid simulation or like a blood flow simulation or anything, you may care really about the accuracy and like the small little details everywhere. So there's there's actually like that decision you have to make and go based on that. And also, I guess like there are these other methods that are popping up, like uh, I guess the work by like Crane and so Rohan Sani, basically they're trying to approach it in a grid free method, sort of like you wanna know the answer in a specific place. And then there's a method that can give you the answer for that specific location, no matter how small or complex your geometry becomes. So there's that and also like you said there's like hope for like the the research that's coming up that's always like improving in very mysterious ways so like something that's very complex or mind-boggling will eventually be solved and it's not as hard anymore in the future yeah, it's amazing right and then some of it's accidental right it's just amazing how things can leap forward so yeah i think I think the most important thing is to just sort of keep doing what you're doing and then um, ideally set your goals and your endpoints, right? Um, it's really important. For the biology side, um, knowing if your something is good enough, the best way to do that is just to validate it with the biology. So, so I think my thing is predicting blah, 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 and now I'm gonna go test it and see if that's true for X, Y, and Z experiments, right? And so that's how we do it. We do a lot of um, modeling right now for things that I think aren't as quite as relevant for y'all, but, um, and then we just go back always and do the experiment to say, okay, so with these parameters did what is what we guessed, right. You know, and sometimes it isn't, sometimes it's not. So. But also uh, one really cool thing that Sina reminded me of is that 
Yes, yeah, sometimes in graphics, we only care about visualization, but it occurred to me during your talk, Professor Stevens, that um, sometimes you don't even know where things are. There wasn't a good map for the body. Right. And so just knowing that spatial information, visualizing yeah. it would be super important uh, in these types of scientific problems. Yeah. yeah, if anybody wants to come do that. So what we are, so we're really good at all of the biology stuff, the 3D printing, but we're not as good as the computational side. So if anybody's looking for a job, you let me know. <laughs> Thank you. We'll keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> with that, uh, that concludes today's session. If you have any more questions, please join the Discord. Um, we'll post the link for it uh, online. And um, We'll see you next week for a talk by uh, Leanne Makatura and Stephanie Wang uh, on, on Friday at 2 p.m. Right. Thank you very much to both of you for attending our session. Thank you. Thank you.